a follow-up webinar from a session that we ran with uh, Central Queensland University with the athletics for the, um, the podiatry um, students up there alongside uh, La Trobe University and Charles State University. So today we have um, a number of students that uh, are both new to Water Tech and been using this for a couple of years. We have a a number of clients who will, um, uh, this will be good revision for them. We also have quite a few uh, clients that don't use us who um, are welcome to, to jump in and have a look at what we do. So uh, for those of us who do use this, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, there's a, a number of different ways that you guys can get access to this information that I'm going to go through today. For clients, you'll be familiar with uh, our online portal, so you can go in through uh, through the portal and have a look at uh, the custom orthotic designs and scripts, our semi-custom, our prefab uh, orthotics and our, our Control 360 Pro where we, we build a pre-made into a semi-custom orthotic for you. For those uh, using our online scripts, you'll be familiar with this page here. So on the right-hand side, if you go into designs here, you click on there and it's broken down to midfoot, midfoot and combination designs and then you can always have a refresher and come back and have a look at, um, a look at these uh, after today's session. And for those of you who are using our software, you, and, and you've been able to do this for six or seven years, but a lot of people are still not aware that these little info buttons here are hyperlinkable. So just click on the, the info button and it takes you through to that section of the script and then click on midfoot, rear foot or combination and that'll take you through more information. So there's a number of different ways that you can access the information uh, after today's session. So I'm going to use the, um, uh, and this is this is the portal. So you can also get in through the educational website that way. This is just a, a sample one, there's no tracking here. So I'm going to go in through the educational website and, and, and click through these and talk about the different designs. So on our um, uh, software script, we have seven designs plus section that says other. We've actually added two more rear foot designs um, over the last couple of years and we need to do an update to the, to the software. So we've got the inverted in brackets, peaking the sus and taking the tail and our heel strike wedge. But if we click into there, you'll see there's a, a true inverted and a concave wedge, which I'll talk about um, today as well. So we'll start at the top and talk about the uh, three different midfoot controlling devices. And then I'll also bring them up in our CAD software, which is here, and we can zoom in and have a look at um, uh, how and why we recommend them for different foot types and, and different conditions. If we talk about the, the mod route to begin with, it was quite a, a popular orthotic if we go back um, 20 years, uh, and it was by far the most uh, popular orthotic that we, we were, uh, or, or the clients were ordering. Over the years, there's been a lot of information come out about first rate function, uh, resupination, min mass uh, mechanism, high gear loading, and it's all about uh, allowing the first rate to drop so that the helix can, can dorsiflex and so the patient can re-supinate. And largely, a lot of people stopped using the mod route because it's quite distally controlling. So it's the most distally controlling orthotic and it's going to push up underneath the first ray. So because it's pushing up underneath the first ray, uh, you, you are preventing the first right ray from dropping uh, in order to, to get that minimus mechanism firing. And so it still has a place, but we, we mainly recommend it for um, issues to do with the, the hallux or the big toe. So hallux rigidus, hallux limitus, uh, or, or some versions of hallux limitus, um, some versions of um, uh, hallux abducto valgus, turf toe, uh, fractured sesamoids. So areas where you want to support behind the first ray uh, is generally the conditions that we will recommend it for. Uh, in, 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 in all of these, we're mainly talking about an overpronated pronated foot. Um, 
So the, most of the midfoot designs are based around a normal subtalar joint axis, so a, a, a normal, if you like, being uh, running from posterior lateral pelvic through the second, third method, where um, medial to that subtalar joint axis, uh, we have a, a, a supination moment. I'll just quickly jump into, um, because I know we've got some students and some first and second year students. So the, the subtalar joint axis uh, theory is anything on the medial side to that axis is going to be a, a supination moment upon a ground reaction force or upon um, the, the, the foot stepping on the orthotic. So any control through here is going to tip it on the, that axis and supinate the foot or re-supinate the foot. Uh, anything uh, put lateral to that side is going to pronate it. So, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this with the rear foot uh, devices. But most of the midfoot controlling devices, you, you, you're going to use them for a, a normal um, subtalar joint axis, still within an overpronated foot or a hypermobile pronated foot that isn't due to a medially deviated subtalar joint axis. And so that's, that covers the, the mod route. We generally recommend between zero and 10 degrees of rear foot varus. So your, your midfoot controlling devices have a, a ratio of one to one or one to two when we're talking about um, the neutral calcaneal stance position. So obviously there's a number of factors, supination resistance, foot type, uh, body weight, usage as to how you determine what your rear foot varus control is. But if you've got a neutral calcaneal stance position of say uh, four degrees, then it's gonna be somewhere between four and eight or, or uh, four and 10 on a one to one or a one to two ratio with the, the mod route. The other thing to, to consider as we start to move away from the mod routes into the part first row fills or full first row fills is that we're starting to take contact away from the foot. So this orthotic is generally a very comfortable orthotic for most patients and probably falls into the category of what people expect from a custom orthotic as far as you know, a, a lay person is concerned, they would expect the orthotic to conform or fit to their foot. So as we move away from this, um, in order to give the patient a, a better biomechanical device, uh, often that needs to come with some education to the patient about why they might not feel contact forward of the arch as we move away. Um, uh, from this because we are starting to drop beneath the first row, which is what the, the mod root part first row fill uh, is about. So we're contouring the first row in the mod root. In the mod root first row fill, we have a 50% fill between the apex of the arch and posterior first method. And that's to allow the first row to actually drop. Now I've got a few um, orthotics here. It, it, Actually, I might bring up the, um, the CAD software for a second. So we're quite parabolic there in the shape of the orthotic. So we achieve two things by moving away from that with the part first row fill. We take the, the physical shape away from the foot to allow it to drop. But as we straighten out this section of the orthotic, we actually get more flex into the device. So you'll get more flex in the anterior aspect of the orthotic. So you allow it to drop. And then if there's pressure on, on the orthotic, it will flex again. And we'll talk about the rear foot devices a little bit later that have a, uh, they peak early and drop away over a longer distance. That long flat section of the orthotic creates much more flex. And that's what we want because we don't want to be controlled beneath that point. Right. Michelle was just saying, if you want to ask questions, uh, feel free to, to write them. I might leave questions uh, to the very end just so I can get through through all of it. Um, now, most, most of these are put sit between four and eight degrees. So as we start to take contact away from the foot, um, we generally recommend in, in the overnight, overpronated foot, we complement that 
with some degree of rear foot bearers control. And the reason for that in a, in a closed um, kinematic chain when the foot's planted on the, on the floor, as you invert the rear foot or as you um, create a bearer's force to the, to the calcaneus, it's naturally going to pick up the uh, articulating bones further forward to, to lift up the arch. So it starts to pick up the talus, the tail set starts to abduct, and it starts to pick up the tarsal joints. And so you become less reliant on the apex of the arch as you start to incorporate um, rear foot bearers into the device, just because it naturally picks up the mid tarsal joints. <laughs> and so complementing um, Complementing that force means you're less reliant on the apex of the arch and you enable the first ray to drop more freely. So this is our most common orthotic um, across the nine designs. And I'll just, uh, I'll go in and just show you some stats on it. So this makes up 28% uh, of all orthotics that we uh, receive at the moment. And it also, uh, because it's our most popular one, it's, it's the basis for our um, Control 360 orthotics, which I'll just click into quickly to show you. So these two here, one's, one's got a rear foot post, one doesn't, um, is your mod root part first row right here. You can see it drops down. The reason it's changing colours is that they're all all different densities. So the only difference between the top two um, is the rear foot post. And then the, the wedge device, which I'll come back to when I'm talking about that, uh, is also part of that, um, those, those pre-made orthotics. So the final one of our um, mid-foot controlling devices is our full first row fill. So you can see it, it hits the apex of the arch and then it's almost a straight line uh, down to posterior first and the joke. So it really allows, um, allows two things. It takes contact away from the first ray, uh, but because of the, the nature of the materials being straightened, um, it'll actually flex much, much easier. So if you take a three mil 3D print or polypropylene or carbon fiber in this design here, and you do a three mil in this design here, this one's gonna have much more flex anterior to the apex of the arch. So that parabolic shape of the mod root um, is harder to flex. So that's important. You're doing two things. You're taking contact away from the, the first ray and you're allowing it to, to flex. <clears throat> so that, that covers the, um, the midfoot uh, devices. Actually, before I move on, so as we start to create uh, reverse mons extensions, uh, extended for valgus control for treating things like plantar fasciitis, where there's a lot of research about inverting rear foot, inverting forefoot to, to shorten the distance between the, the calcaneus and the net heads to take the pressure off the, um, uh, the plantar fasci, then you need to make sure you're creating, or, or sorry, prescribing an orthotic design that enables that first ray to drop down. You don't want to be doing reverse Mortons or, or forefoot valguses in a, in a mod root design because you're pushing that forefoot back onto the first ray. Um, you're wanting that first ray to, to, uh, to drop, but then you're blocking it with the, um, with the design that you've chosen. So, okay, so we'll move into the, um, the rear foot devices. So, you know, going back, as I said before, a couple of years ago, we've added a couple of uh, rear foot devices, which I'll, I'll go through. And again, rear foot devices, um, if we go back to, to this, make up about 35, 36% um, of the, the orders that we receive. And that's broken into our concave wedge, our true inverted, um, our heel scarf wedge, and then our inverted as well. So we'll go through each of those now. So firstly, uh, the inverted. So they're, we've, we've put in brackets sus tail because they're designed to peak at the sus and tacular and tail line, and then they, they drop away pretty quickly. So if we use this uh, theory to describe what we're trying to achieve, <clears throat> we need to get as much 
uh, control into the supination moment. So that's media to that medially deviated subtelogen axis. And that's the only area that we can actually control this sort of foot type. So they're generally reserved for your, your pest planus foot types, uh, your pest planus with your uh, abducted feet. So you can have hypermobile flat feet that don't necessarily fall into this category of a, a medially deviated subtype of an axis. And with those orthotics, you can go back to a midfoot. But if you are measuring the, the subtitle drone axis in the clinic and using this one as an example, if, if your um, subtitle drone axis is posterior lateral pelvic running through the navicular, for example, then you've got to get all that control behind it. And the reason the orthotics drop away pretty quickly is that we don't want to support this area of the foot. So we don't want to support. Um, you know, sub first metatarsal or uh, uh, cuneiforms or anything like that. So again, taking contact away from the foot and allowing it to drop. So this sort of orthotic, the inverted orthotic can have any sort of heel cup you like. So if you need a rear foot controlling device and the heel cup is important to you for, let's use plantar fasciitis as a, another example where you want to contain the fat pad or you want to build some cushioning inside the heel to dampen the compression forces uh, on heel strike, then your inverted orthotic is the orthotic to use. You can have a 20 or 30 mil heel cup uh, or, or a 12 mil heel cup. Some of the other um, rear foot devices, we can't have those, those heel cups. <coughs> so your, your inverted devices sort of have a one to five ratio when we look at uh, uh, neutral calcaneal stance position. Once again, you need to factor in other things like supination resistance. But if you had a, a, 40, a five degree neutral calcaneal stance, then you're looking at about a 25 degree um, uh, rear foot varus in the inverted orthotic. <coughs> and some people that, that like to be conservative in their orthotics um, will often you know, not want to go to 20 or 25 degrees, but you've just got to keep in, um, in the back of your mind that this is the area of the, the foot that you need to get all your control in. And, and upon ground reaction, this whole area of the foot is a, is a pronatory force tipping, tipping you on that axis. So, you know, trying to counteract that as a pronatory force with four, five, six degrees in such a small area of the rear foot just doesn't tend to, to work uh, and doesn't tend to be comfortable. So people like to be conservative in their rear foots so that they create a comfortable device. But if you put four or five or six degrees in that area there, then all you're asking uh, of the orthotic is the apex of the arch and then it does become uncomfortable. So, um, and, and we'll see the, the intrinsic rear foot um, angle as we move into the, the next device, which is your, your heel sky web. So again, sus tali peaks at the same point, same theory in relation to taking contact away from um, uh, midfoot and allowing that material to bottom out. But as you can see on the right hand side here, it is um, a wedge from medial to lateral. <laughs> and because it's a wedge, it has no concavity to the base of it. Uh, and so we liken it to a, a doorstop underneath the medial calc to maximally invert the calcaneus uh, in, in a relatively low bulk device. And so we're looking at roughly a one to three ratio with your, um, uh, with your heel scarf wedge. So if the patient's sitting in four degrees neutral calcaneus stance position, again, taking into consideration other factors, then in multiple of three gets you to our most common um, 12 degree in the in the um, the heel scope wedge sus tali. So this is one device that we probably wouldn't recommend if you were treating plantar fasciitis, for example, because you are pressing up on the medial calf and it can be uncomfortable. So again, yeah, talking about the heel cups, these can't have a heel cup, so it is scarred from medial to lateral, lateral to medial. And if we put a heel cup on them, they end up being vertical heel cups uh, and they're relatively uncomfortable. So, and, and that probably leads us onto the, the concave wedge. So we had, um, sorry, I've got to jump down the concave wedge. We had 
quite a few people wanting or liking the idea of the wedge, but wanting a heel cup. And so by the time we, we put a heel cup on this device here that isn't vertical, we've got to round out the medial side, round out the lateral side posterior um, to, to create a concavity so that we can get a rounded, uh, rounded heel cup. And so we came up with a, the concave wedge. So we've created, um, and it comes as a six degree, uh, sorry, a six mil heel cup. So same theory but with a six mil heel cup, it allows you to get some concavity underneath uh, the plantar calc with a small heel cup. So if you wanted to build in some slow release pull on or, or anything else for cushioning, you've got the room to do it within the concave wedge. And the last one of the uh, inverted is, uh, sorry, the rear foot is our true inverted. So the true inverted, and I might bring the CAD software back up to have a look at the true inverted. <coughs> So the true, true inverted is here. So the, the high point is actually medial calc. And so the area that you've got to work in an orthotic like that is sort of posterior lateral calc to medial, to, to medial calc. So that's your whole pronation, uh, sorry, supination force. That's where you're building in all your control and the rest of it drops away really quickly. So we brought this out a couple of years ago because some clients, we're finding that the inverted device was too far forward uh, and they needed it, needed it further back. So the theory behind uh, that orthotic there is if you're measuring the subtalar joint axis, you're mainly measuring it non-weight bearing. And so you can, if people want to know how to do it, then they can send an email to hellohorthotech.com.au and I'll reply back or I'll jump on the phone to show you how to do it. But you can palpate posterior lateral calc um, and you can walk a line, you can find the subtalar joint axis. So let, let's assume for a minute that this picture here is non weight bearing and you're going posterior lateral calc out through, let's say, posterior navicular. When that patient stands up, that axis moves medially as the tibia rotates internally, as the foot pronates. So what you can have is uh, a subtalar joint axis that's there, non weight bearing, but when they stand, that shifts all the way around here. And so it actually moves more posterior. And so what we were finding with a small percentage of patients is that we needed to bring that further back in order to get behind or medial to the subtalar joint axis. So again, if we go back, And so in the last couple of years, that's become 5% of our orders are now true inverted. So it used to just be the inverted, then we added the, the, the heel scarf wedge, then the concave wedge. And now there's a good mix of all those different rear foot. So rear foot uh, in total is, is 30, so 35, so I can't say 35 or 36 degrees, uh, sorry, percent of, of the orders that, that we get. And then the rest of it falls into the, the combination devices, which I'll um, jump into me now. So the combination devices um, are really combining what we're doing with the rear foot with what we're trying to do in the midfoot. So it's not a pure uh, rear foot, it's not a pure midfoot, it's combining them both. And the, the most popular one would be the, the mid inverted. So the, the mid inverted, and as the name suggests, it's halfway between a midfoot controlling and an inverted or rear foot controlling in its high point, so its high point is, is subtalar navicular. And then we carry that through with like a part first rate fill forefoot. So we still allow that first rate to drop. Uh, and again, it sits in between the recommended um, rear foot correction. So midfoot's between zero and 10, uh, rear foot's between 15 and 30, and this sort of sits in the middle. And that's becoming a more and more popular, popular orthotic. <clears throat> so, and so while we've spoken about eight or nine, oh, sorry, we'll go into the heel scribe midfoot. So the same, same theory with the heel scribe sus tali, only the apex is now midfoot. And we initially ordered out um, 
five or six years ago for podiatrists that were treating children. So you, you get those children hypermobile flat foot, you put them in a mod route and they just fall over the medial aspect of the arch. That doesn't really offer much control. Uh, the, the next best option is to go into a UCBL, high medial lateral heel cuts, and, and try and contain the soft tissue. Um, uh, but it's quite a bulky orthotic and doesn't always fit into the shoes. So this works really well. It started off just, we, we just started recommending it for children where, okay, how do we maximally invert the rear foot and offer midfoot control? And it works really well for that hypermobile uh, flat foot in children. And not really designed for your medially deviated flat foot, which children can have as well because the, uh, the apex is too far forward. So. It's more a hypermobile flat foot with children. And then clients started uh, using it for hypermobile flat feet in adults, and that was also getting uh, good results. So while it did start off uh, for children, it has um, transitioned into to working well with adults. <coughs> so just want to jump back here for a sec. So this is um this we haven't given a name to there's a lot of different variations um that we do so we've got one client that recently wanted a the orthotic to peak at the sustenance frontale so like our inverted orthotic but they wanted more of a, a mod foot uh, mod root type forefoot so we just gave it a name and called it a um inverted with a modified root forefoot so that and that's the shape that's working really well for some of their patients and we get that with with other designs so we can get a mid inverted with a full first ray in the forefoot so while there's nine designs and while nine designs can, can be complicated in itself at times uh, if you're looking for something else um, that we don't don't offer then that's just a matter of giving it a name or, um, and, and some people name it after, after themselves. So uh, we do have another section in there. So we've come up with a design that suits what you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and so we, we don't want to pigeonhole you into, um, in, into what, what we have to offer you then for your own design. Sorry, I thought someone was asking me, me a question. So. <coughs> Oh, is it? Okay, sorry, there's questions. All right, let me have a look. Do other labs have this many designs? Um, look, I, I, I know some of them don't, uh, and I know um, uh, some of them probably do. We've, we've slowly added designs that we uh, think are valid, and I completely get that um, it, it can be quite overwhelming. Uh, and so for, especially for students and for people starting to, to learn their biomechanics, we'll generally recommend that you start with um, two or three of our designs. So uh, your mod root part first ray fill uh, being uh, that one there. So being our most common, common design, uh, our inverted orthotic um, as, as a root foot. Sorry, there's quite a few open here. Our inverted orthotic for the rear foot, and then our the mid inverted. So start with those those three. They're pretty pretty easy to understand. And then as you get more confident with your prescribing, or as you start to see patients where you need other designs, then just just slowly step into them. We've got clients that have been with us for twenty years that would still only use three or four um, of the designs. Um, yet we have. We have others that, that step in and, 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 and have a go with the others. You'll see with uh, so you'll see like the heel scarf wedge midfoot is only used two percent of the time. The true inverted five. So if you stick to your inverted um, uh, mod root or mod root part first rate fill and the mid inverted, so those three three big ones there. And then your, your mod root for your hallux issues uh, and, and just expand from there. So the other question I've got here is, uh, is a TCI exactly what we see through in the scan or does it get changed in the CAD? So a TCI being a, a total contact in, in a cell or being 
uh, referred to as an accommodative device, um, we contour the scan uh, exactly. So with a modified route, we'll be very close, um, but with a, a TCI, which is often used for, for diabetics, um, then we will follow it, uh, follow it exactly. <laughs> If anyone else has got questions, um, now is probably a good time to, to, to throw them out there. So we've got about 10 minutes. I can keep talking about other things for, for five minutes. But if you've got any questions, please, um, please just post them now and I'll answer them. So all of those nine designs are also in our semi-custom range of athletics. So again, if you're using our semi-custom form, it's just a matter of writing the design in that you want there. And it brings up, brings up the look. And so for a very long time, we've had our most popular um, mod route, part first row field, our inverted, our wedge and our mid inverted. So that's sort of been our semi-custom range. One of the advantages with 3D printing is that we've been able to create a, a library of, of scans, if you like, that um, you can use the templates that we give you or the sizing boards that we give you. Uh, so you've now got access to all nine of our designs. You can't vary these ones up. You can't do a, you know, invert a bit of modified root foot, four foot or, or any other variation with the semi-custom, but the, the other, five designs so the mod root the full first row fill midfoot heel scope wedge true inverted and compact wedge can now be ordered in 3d print so let's let's cover all the designs pretty quickly in, in half an hour for those of you who are still uh, interested i'll touch a little bit on what i was talking about in uh, at, at the University in Queensland a couple of weekends ago because there's quite a bit of good feedback in the um, compression and rebound times of different materials. So we still offer all the materials. We are 54% um, 3D print at the moment. We did get up to about 75% 3D print and then it's come off and it's leveled off at around 54% because the other materials still offer different properties. So, and, and compression and rebound timing is, is one of them. So um, composite has the fastest rebound. So when we talk about rebound, it, it's as we uh, flex the athletic, how quickly we bounce back out of it. So composite um, doesn't require too much force before it flexes and it rebounds really quickly. So. We use that for marathon runners. And, you know, we talk on the education website about one directional athletes using it because as they pronate into it, they can serve that energy and bounce out pretty quickly. Uh, 3D print sits sort of in the middle, so it does require a little bit more force. And again, this is a hard, um, uh, we've done this with our moderate part first rate fill. So obviously, uh, an inverted orthotic is designed to flex different to a mod route, but we've done it with our most popular um, uh, midfoot controlling device. So it requires a little bit more force on the same, at the same thickness. And it rebounds faster than poly, but not as fast as composite. So the, the 3D print sort of sits in the middle there in relation to its rebound, rebound rate. Polypropylene still has a place because it, it doesn't take as much force to, to flex and it rebounds a little bit slower than the other two. So if you've got um, you know, a, a hot spot or a blister or you know, a fibroma or something where you want the, one of the rigid materials to, to flex and to rebound slower uh, for comfort, then you're better off going into a uh, polypropylene device over the other, other two uh, rigid materials. Uh, and then uh, you've got EVA and subalphaline, so we still we still use subalphaline, although you can see up there it's sitting at around one percent of our orders. So we we never phased it out because people are still still ordering them. But um, yeah, polypropylene still makes up about twenty five percent of our orders. EVA and composite, and then three D print um, is is more than half of the orders that we receive. 
this little um, table at the top just goes through some pros and cons of the different materials. So 3D printed when it comes to modifying it's in your clinic, it, it's a little bit harder than polypropylene or EVA. It's a little bit hard to grind. It's a little bit harder to heat adjust. It's not as hard as composite. Composite's quite typical. We generally get them sent back here. You need um, sort of proper grinders and, and experience to modify the composite. Um, repeatability, you 3D print. If you want the exact same orthotic 10 years later, you will get it. Um, polypropylene and EDA, we tend to change the way we do things over time to, to better what we do. And so sometimes the grind in 10 years is going to be slightly different to, to what it was 10 years ago. Um, and that's just natural evolution of how we, how we do things. As much as they're direct milled, they're still hand finished. Uh, and so we do try and improve on, on things. And that might mean that it's slightly different to what we were doing five or 10 years ago. Rebound rate, so your composite, if that's important, composite um, is the material to go, go for. Um, and I, I've gone through that, so I won't, I won't touch on rebound rate. 3D prints is by far the lightest orthotic, and that was one of the overwhelming benefits when we started doing it. So people hardly noticed the orthotic in their shoes. So um, if, if weight's an issue, then you know this is all on our educational website for our clients uh, um, and that they can access. Thickness, composite is still the, uh, the thinnest material. So a three mil composite is more like a five mil 3D printed poly. Um, but then 3D printed poly aren't far behind. They obviously mediate and so forth. Turnaround times, there are issues with getting, uh, we've got three plus, it's probably more like realistically uh, four to five plus. The um, material comes out of the 3D printers at uh, close to 200 degrees. And it's got to go through a slow cool down process, otherwise, the material properties change, it becomes brittle. So, you're really looking at three days before we can pull it out of the 3D printer and start to work on it. Whereas, if you needed something urgently, uh, we can make any of the other ones within, within one day. And then, um, the price, if, if price um, is important to you, then you know, polypropylene and EVA are, are generally a cheaper orthotic than, than composite and 3D print, although it, it's not a huge amount. You could be looking at five, 10, 15 dollars difference between them. So, um, so I've got a couple more questions. So, uh, found inverting forefoot and calculating okay, shortening the length of plantar fascia is a great way to treat plantar fasciitis. I want to ask again, what design and modifications you recommend? <clears throat> so the two, um, the two from, from forces, uh, if we look at the tissue stress model of plantar fasciitis is your compression force. So you, as you hit the ground, you get compression uh, and then uh, your tensile force. So as the foot pronates, it elongates and then you get that tensile force on the plantar fascia. So one of the ways um, to, to shorten that tensile force is to, Invert the rear foot and either the forefoot. <clears throat> and you can, even if you just take your shoes off and go a pronated foot, put it on the ground and go from a, a resting calcaneal to a neutral calcaneal, you'll see the foot shorten um, anywhere from sort of five mil up to sort of 20 mil over pronated foot. And then if you invert the forefoot, that shit shortens it even more. So, uh, as far as the design, so we're looking at. Um, again, it, it, it's foot type dependent. So if there are pes primus foot type, then you're going to go into one of the rear foots. But um, the most common is your moderate part first row fill. So you're allowing that first row to come across by taking the contact uh, anterior uh, from the arch away or dropping it. And that enables you to put that forefoot pelvis support into the orthotic to, to shorten that distance. So, uh, that along with slow release pull-on or XRD pull-on underneath the heel um, is a good prescription for plantar fasciitis. If you can get the heel cup a little bit higher, then you're starting to contain the fat pad uh, or, or the natural fat pad as well for that compression force cushioning underneath the um, underneath the, the trochanus. What's the difference between uh, a semi and a prefab 
So the, the prefab, um, if we go into it, you've restricted to essentially two designs in, in polypropylene. So if we uh, just go back into, uh, so you're looking at a five degree midfoot and a five degree midfoot plus. So the only difference between those two is that one has a half medial stabilizer post. So, so there's a half medial stabilizing post on this. It's midfoot controlling. The other one, same design, doesn't have a medial post to it. So, and then your heel scrub wedge. So you've got essentially two designs. Um, and they are fully customizable. So you can start from a, a really cheap base, add net domes, add cushioning, add four foot pelvises, and you can build an orthotic for a really affordable price for your patient that where, where, where price might be sensitive. Uh, but you are restricted to the two designs in doing that. You semi custom, you've got your nine designs. Um, and so while I'm on this, this is what we call a, I suppose, a reducible product. So I can put a, a first MPJ cutout or first ray cutout. I can drop the heel cut to six mil from 12. I can reduce it down. With the semi custom, you, you can, um, and I'll, I'll jump across to that. Uh, you can have whatever you'd like. So you can have a 30 mil heel cut, you can have gate plates, you can have rigid Morton's extensions, and you can choose from one of the nine designs. Um, it's, it gets pretty close to a custom orthotic, but we're not starting with a cast of, uh, of, of the patient's foot. So there's a, a big difference between the semi and the, um, and, and the prefabs. Um, is there a more updated prescription form that has the concrete wedge on it? Uh, there will be shortly, uh, but this is the form here. Just put in other at the moment. Um, just tick that and put concrete wedge. Um, and the, the, uh, everything else is the same. So you can, you can write it in there. Alternatively, uh, with the online form, so, design, it's sitting there. So if you're using the online form, it is up to date. If you're using the software form, then you just need to put it in, in the other box until we do the update, which we are, which we are working on. Um, how are you finding the durability of 3D print materials over time compared to poly? As used historically, uh, we all have the experience of long durability of poly. I'm not always sure how to set the expectation for patients when dispensing the new 3D print. So we've been 3D printing since 2017, so we're four years into it now. And the longevity is no different in my opinion to um, polypropylene. What is, um, what is different is in both composite and, uh, and through, uh, I don't know, a 3D print and composite, we get about a 5% fracture rate in Morton's extensions. So as they bend through them over time, uh, those materials can, can fracture. So I, we will, we'll always make them in 3D print and make them in composite if people want them. But if it cracks and we remake it under warranty, we'll move to poly because it's just too much force going through uh, that Morton's extension for that patient. Uh, all the other extensions, gate plates and things like that have been fine. So to and hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot of difference in relation to the longevity. So, uh, we get rid of poly like other labs have. I love using poly. So, um, the short answer is no. So, it is still 25% of our orders, and hopefully, I've explained why um, it is 25% of our orders. Uh, I understand why labs do it. Um, some would have to run multiple softwares, but multiple software subscriptions, they're not cheap, um, to, to direct mill or to mill positives or 3D print. So the, the cost of doing all that can be quite expensive. We've always developed our own software, we've got the range to do it all. And as you, as you can see, we've, um, we're still doing sub which is 1% of our, our orders, but people still want it, so we're still offering it. 
Are you finding 3D print devices flex out quickly, get softer quicker? So I think I answered that um, with the last question. Uh, we haven't really noticed any difference to poly. If you put a you know 130 kilo person in a two mil uh, 3D print, it will bottom out, but so will poly if you do the same thing. So the same sort of engineering principles apply when, uh, when, when choosing the thickness uh, of the device, but no, we haven't really seen them flex out or get softer. Um, can we have access to the webinar at a later date? Because I found help. Um, yeah, so you'll get an email. Um, it'll be on the portal. So, so all our clients will have access to it. Uh, Non-clients, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you know, hello, I, 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 so certainly all our webinars are posted on our portal so that you guys can uh, can have a refresher. So, what type of casts? I mean, I'll start with the first one. Uh, I've answered that one, so that was, oh, you, you guys can see that one anyway. So, um, I'll take that away for privacy for people. Um, yeah, so that was the plant fasciitis with inverting uh, uh, the, the calcaneus. I've answered that. Uh, what type of casts can you work with? So we can work with anything, so phone boxes, plastic casts. Um, uh, we've got our own 3D mini scanner. We've got laser scanners. If you've got, uh, there's the iPad scanners. Um, so basically, any cast that you want to want to create, we can we can work with. So uh, we scan all the casts if they're plaster or foam box into our system, and if they're scans, then we, we keep them forever. So there's a few changes going on with uh, with the iPad scanner and, and the new iPhones and iPads that uh, is a bit controversial. Um, I spoke about that at the uh, last weekend. Um, yeah, whether podiatrists should be uh, using iPhones and iPads without attachments on them to uh, create scans uh, is a bit controversial. You, you, you're teaching the patient that they can scan their own foot. And while uh, it's not happening on mass now, uh, with 3D prints, bureaus popping up, and you know, patients may think they can scan their foot, send it to you know, IBM or, you know, you know, HP or whatever and get something printed up. It's not a custom orthotic, it's not designed correctly, but in their mind it might be. So that's a challenge for the future. Uh, the, in my opinion, the old structure sensor scanner uh, clip-on, yeah, won't be developed too much further because the new iPads that have been out for 12 months have got 3D scanners built into them that are more accurate. So if you're using that technology, you're probably going to have to transition to like the iPad 11 Pro in the future or you know, iPad 12 or 13 as they come out with uh, scanners or the iPhone, or you're going to have to move away to, and, and we've got a number of podiatric only scanners that aren't available to the general public. So I think that's answered all the questions and we're up to sort of 50 minutes. So um, if there's no more, yeah. Um, sorry, I've got one more. Uh, what's the most popular 3D print thickness? Is it less than three mil? Um, I think a lot of people go for three mil, but you you can be micron accurate with the 3D printers. So uh, where poly used to be probably accurate to half millimeter, so two two point five three. You can now go 2.6, 2.75, 2.85. So you can just increase your prescription variables a little bit with the 3D print. Um, but the vast majority of it sit between 2.5 and, and 3.5. Again, on our on our website, we've got recommended um, uh, millimeters for various weight patients. Although just using weight. Um, it's sometimes difficult. You've got to take into consideration the foot type, supination resistance, the amount of pronation, what they're using the orthotic for. So uh, what weight is just one uh, one area to take into consideration. But if, you, if you're unsure, just give us a call and we can walk you through it.
um, how are you going with TGA requirements? So uh, we will be, is it 2024? It's October 2024 that labs need to be TGA approved. So we've submitted all the paperwork, we're going through the process, but they're giving all of us plenty of time to do what we need to do. Um, sorry? Yeah, so we're in regular communication with the A.A. about what needs to be done. Um, it's a bit of revenue raising. It's, it'll be quite expensive, but it's just something we have to do. All labs will have to do it. Anyone manufacturing in your own athletics is, is either going to have to do it or transition to a lab. Um, so that's, they've also got until October 2024. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, if you want any more information, send emails to hello at Orthotech. Um, and we'll get back to you. And if you've enjoyed this, we'll, we'll add you to our list and we'll send you um, uh, any upcoming webinars. We're going to just try and do lunchtime, uh, you know, 45, maybe an hour, just so that people, you know, don't have to sit there for a couple of hours and, uh, <coughs> and listen to me talk. So uh, during lockdown, there's been quite a few people attended this because I think everyone's locked up. So, but ho hopefully, you know, around the one o'clock, um, every now and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of work an hour and hopefully we can jump in. Yes, so. uh, Michelle just said we're sending out CBD point certificates if you've registered and attended this. So, um, yeah, it's just a, a way to easily get your CBD points up, especially during lockdown uh, where, you know, there's not that many events on. Okay. Um, well, I think that's it. So thank you everyone for attending. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and there'll be a bit of information. If you want more information or if you're interested in any particular products, you'll have a form that you can fill out now and send that through and, uh, and we'll make sure we get back to you pretty quickly. Okay, thank you.